If you're someone who identifies with being radical or non-normative, marginalized, an outsider of some kind, then you might find that you have a natural tendency to want to stay away from things that are labeled as being particularly conservative or traditional, um, whether that's relationships, family structures, um, ways of relating to the world. But I think sometimes that binary does us a disservice um, because we can let people who are um, values-wise more, I don't know, conservative or right-wing or what have you, um, have claim over the ground of large swaths of life, like family, relationship, home, um, community. And so in this video, I just wanted to do a little coffee chat, a little uh, tea chat. So grab yourself um, a beverage and I'm just going to share some thoughts that I've been having about this lately using to some extent some uh, astrology and, and tarot um, concepts that have gotten me kind of um, given me a, a language or a way of thinking about this and um, to kind of think about, you know, what it means to be um, radical or progressive or non-normative or marginalized, whatever ones of these terms you identify with, um, and to sometimes long for um, a sense of security or um, tradition or, uh, you know, what have you um, in these areas of your life. So if you're new to this channel, first let me just introduce myself. Hi, my name is Avery, um, and I helped justice-aligned, neurodivergent, and nerdy humans to cultivate ease and self-trust for growing into our emerging future. Um, a lot of the folks that I work with are neurodivergent, are queer, um, maybe polyamorous, uh, etc. And, you know, it might be that for a lot of us, I think for large parts of our lives, we've identified ourselves in terms of how we are different from the norm, um, how we are, you know, not necessarily uh, following the traditional milestones of, um, of family, of relationship, of community, even just like life course. Um, there's this term that you may have heard of before, uh, cr chrononormativity. I believe it's Elizabeth is it Freeman? I'm, I'm blanking on the name right at this moment, but um, came up with this concept of chrononormativity, which is the idea of like um, a normative life course or like specific milestones that we're expected to have. You know, what does it mean to be adult? Um, what does it mean to like come of age? What does it mean to, um, to grow older and like what we're expected to do? Um, there's this concept as well of uh, the relationship escalator. You may have heard the idea of like milestones along relationships where it's like, you know, you meet someone often of the opposite sex, you, uh, you know, <laughs> like what is, the <laughs> I'm so off of it, I can't remember what it is. You, <laughs> you meet someone, you know, you start dating, maybe you cohabit cohabitate, um, then you, somebody proposes, probably a man, then you get married, you have kids, you know, that, that kind of like relationship uh, escalator is another like term for this. Um, there's lots of, of like ways of um, talking about this, but basically what I'm talking about is the like, that some of those like general ideas of, you know, what does it mean to be an adult, um, to be in relationships? What does family mean? What does tradition mean? Um, and a lot of these like concepts are, I think we can kind of associate the broader category, come to associate the broader category with the more like normative version. So, um, you know, it might be if we're thinking about relationships, um, you know, thinking about marriage, it might be though also um, even like if we think about, you know, uh, relationship to like family and culture and tradition, um, well, what does it mean if you want to break away from what your family or um, the broader culture that you're a part of practices? You know, is there something for you? Um, there's been a lot of conversation I've noticed in the past five, ten years around sort of what does it mean if you, if you don't belong to a religion? Um, 
like what is your relationship then to your local community um, and to something outside of your immediate family that is rooted in values and rooted in like relationship and, and taking care of each other. Um, what would that look like if it's not religion? Because for a lot of people that was church um, or that was uh, not necessarily church, but you know, temple or synagogue or, um, or some other you know, religious um, institution. If, if you're not rooted in, in a particular religion, like what does that look like? Um, I've worked with, you know, clients uh, who have kids and are trying to figure out like, you know, what does, like, what does ritual look like for kids? What does, what do holidays look like? If a lot of the holidays that other people, you know, practice, they're like, oh, this holiday's racist. This one's affiliated with a religion I don't care about. This one's really nationalist. <laughs> like, what are our holidays then? Um, and there are lots of ways, you know, that folks have reclaimed it. I think if you're um, involved in um, metaphysical spaces or spiritual spaces, it might be that you practice, for example, like the Wheel of the Year is one um, way of, of ritualizing the passage of time. It might be that there, um, that you have um, a relationship to say like a coven if you practice witchcraft or some other um, like more structured form of um, relationship to other people in a community. It might be that you um, have found community institutions that are not like necessarily religiously affiliated, or maybe you, you are religious, but you've, you've tran uh, transferred. You tra sounds like you're transferring to a school. You, you've gone over to a different religion, um, converted. That's the word. Like, what do you call it when you transfer? <laughs> Convert, converted. Maybe you, you know, um, grew up evangelical and you're like, you know, F that, but, but as an adult, you're a progressive Christian, or maybe as an adult, you're um, uh, practicing, you know, paganism or um, whatever other religion, um, Druidry, uh, for example. Um, so a lot of, you know, folks have found their own version of this. But I think I started thinking about this topic um, kind of from an astrological lens um, and also through a tarot lens, because I was thinking about how sometimes when an archetype comes up that is associated with something that is kind of traditional, my impulse personally can be kind of to reject that or to be like, oh, I don't like, I don't really want that archetype right in, in my, in front of my face. Um, there, there's a lot of talk about this in the tarot community, I think with um, archetypes like the emperor card, for example, like the traditional version of the emperor feeling kind of patriarchal or feeling kind of um, government-y. Um, maybe the Hierophant, right? Feeling like a kind of oppressive version of religion um, could be some examples. I think we talk about it a lot with, um, with gender, and I think we talk about it to some extent with like this idea of sort of the state. Um, but, but it goes further than that for me. Um, so example from the tarot, I got a great reading, a really transformative reading for me um, that I was thinking back to as this was coming up again um, from Lex Ritchie uh, who who is awesome, check out Lex Ritchie's work um, but they gave me a reading, I want to say it was December of 2019 um, I believe it was right before I decided to um, move out to the west coast and I, I hadn't even like known I was going to consider that. Um, or maybe actually, I can't remember the timing of the reading. It was either right before I, no, you know what? It, it, I think it was actually like in the midst of that decision because I had had like um, a health crisis and a lot of uncertainty where I was then shocked that my, my current partners who, who, spoiler alert, who I live with, who live upstairs, um, you know, I was like not expecting it that when I had this health crisis and my, my first sort of reaction was like, damn it, you know, I met um, these people that I really care about, one of whom I had started dating, the other whom I hadn't yet, um, but they, they're married to each other. And I had met them in March of, of 2019, so I'd met them about nine months prior, eight months prior. And, you know, it was having this exciting new relationship um, it was the year after I'd had a couple big breakups and so it really felt like a fresh start, a new, there was like the full card was coming up for me all the time. Um, and it felt really good and I had been flying out to the West Coast a lot to see them. Um, I was living in DC at the time and 
just Washington DC, sorry, <laughs> try, try to not be Americentric, um, Washington DC on the East Coast. Um, and I was flying to Washington State on the West Coast, um, you know, really frequently. And I had this healthcare that at the time it was like very possible that I might have a condition, which it turned out not to have, but at that time I, that I might have a condition that would require um, these like, I, think, I don't know if they're considered blood transfusions, but it, it's a very intense therapy um, where like a in-home nurse has to come to your house twice a week and you basically can't travel like, you, you know, for a good couple of years. And I was like, oh man, you know, my initial reaction was like, well, so much for this relationship, you know, that was nice um, while it lasted. Uh, you know, huh, you know, these things like always, always fall apart. And then what I had been really shocked by was that these folks immediate reaction was like, well, can you get the, that in home care in, anywhere? Like, can you move? Like, why don't you move here and we'll take care of you? And I was like, you'll what? <laughs> I'm sorry, you'll, you'll do what now? <laughs> um, you'll, you'll take care. What does that mean? Right? Cause at that time I was very like, used to doing my own thing, being independent, being, you know, sort of like party of one. Um, you know, sometimes I'd have a roommate, I had a roommate at that time, but it was like, I, I didn't have what I like to call, and I really like this term, so feel free to use it. Um, I, I like to call my hurricane friends. Um, this is cause I'm from a place where there are hurricanes. And I always think of it as like, who's your hurricane person? Because that's the person that when there's a natural disaster, you call them. So it's like, you can have really close people in your life, but um, I don't know if I mentioned this concept on the channel before, but um, but I think of it as like, you can have really close people. But the thing that had always been kind of hard for me, I think about being um, someone who does relationship differently, being a relationship anarchist, being solo polyamorous, is that I usually was not the like core person. And I, and I liked that. I didn't want to necessarily be somebody's core person in the day-to-day -day sense, like, uh, the time commitment, the like intensity of that. However, I always thought to myself, if there's a hurricane, it's like, who is the person that you check on first and that you like find and that you go like in a natural disaster and you're like, okay, grab your people and get in the car. It's like, I didn't have that person. And so I always was like, well, damn, I'm just going to die if there's a right or, or I'll just be alone, whatever. But like, you know, I'll either survive on my own or I won't survive at all. But like, I don't really have... A hurricane person and I hadn't for a long time and um and so it was like really touching and also just like transformative for me to have somebody say to me like oh you're having a crisis well like how do we get you where we are um and like merge our lives somewhat without necessarily expecting in this case like oh you're gonna change the way you do relationships you're gonna change who you are um you know, or you're gonna like start calling us your primary partner, like, you know, not requiring that of me, but just saying like, what what can we do to help? So that was happening and I had this reading from Lex um, and one of the cards that I remember Lex pulled was, and I think it was reversed, was the Four of Wands card. And if you know the tarot, I don't have it in front of me, but but um, if you know the tarot, the Smith Rider Waite traditional version of that card, the Four of Wands, is um, it depicts usually like, a, it looks like a wedding. Um, people under an arbor and they're happy and they're partying, you know, and it's like, oh, we just got married kind of vibes. Um, and the fours in the tarot in general have this sense of like structure and container and stability um, related to whatever their element is. And so with the wands, you know, wands have an element of like passion and energy and, and sociability um, is part of what they are. And so that like structure, that container point, that like home base in the wand suit is really all about like joy and play and like an energetic party, but it's also about um, this sense of like home and like heart home, like pat, like your passionate wandsy self, like having a, a place to touch down is how I often think of that card. Um, and you know, I, I I like versions of the card that don't necessarily like have that kind of heteronormative marriage vibe to them. But it was interesting to think Lex brought up um, the way that card has those traditional associations and how it was almost coming up for me in that moment of like my, I think it was reversed because it was like my sort of like 
confusion or like resistance or just just the like relationship to I felt really like excited that somebody cared about me in that way and was looking to me but then it was like am I gonna do this am I gonna like do this thing that at that time I had this like hard limit about relationships was I would not live with somebody and I wasn't planning to necessarily live with them but like the idea of moving across the country where by the way I knew nobody and I still know very few people in the west coast it is kind of funny with COVID it just like it, it turns out you can live somewhere where you don't know anyone but like you know I didn't have a community here I don't have a community here and and that was like am I really gonna leave this like area I've lived for a dozen years where like I've built up a community and all this stuff um and the answer was yes and it turned out that I was actually fine health wise but like you know with everything that's happened I mean it, it worked out it, it, for given value working out but I think I have noticed that that since 2020 like I've had a number of rounds of this where I've been sort of challenged around um, what does it look like to take these like traditional steps in some regard and, and the like underlying emotion and maybe discomfort with or resistance to like, well, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to have like an I told you so moment where it turns out to be like, oh, I didn't really like jive with you and therefore and, and also, um, I don't want to feel like every single thing I have to like reinvent the fuck out of because I don't think, and so this is like shifting out of that story into some of the other thoughts I had, like I don't think that conserv quote unquote conservative people, not that that's like a true binary, but that conservative people should get to have a monopoly on, you know, family and like secure security and like safety, right? Like. You know, the, the idea of, I think part of what's frustrating about not having a hurricane friend is that there is a traditional or conservative like influence, an idea that like the, the people that you grab in the hurricane are going to be those like traditional family type people. So the idea that it's like, I have friends that I'm really close to, but I realized that they would go to their spouse and their kids. And like, I don't begrudge them that. Um, but it's exciting when I have a friend where we connect in such a way and we're like, oh my God, you're, I think you're like actually really close. Like, I think you're one of my best friends. And then sometimes it'll feel like, well, should I say that? Is that hierarchical? Like, <laughs> like blah, blah, blah values. Like, do I really want to say you're my best friend? Um, but I think like a lot of times like ace people, people in the ace spectrum, asexual or aromantic in that like general bubble, which I, which I am, um, you know, it can be really like exciting to have kind of a queer platonic um, partner or like a, a relationship of some kind that like feels like that um, because so much is built around it, right? Like, I mean, we talk about tax breaks, but like there's a lot more than tax breaks that are built around that. Um, there's, you know, just like assumptions around like you'll go to your family that if you're not intentionally kind of feeling out who your family is, sometimes you can get lost. Um, so that's like one thing, and I, I, this is not a video of answers, by the way. It's just sort of like I wanted to bring up some thoughts and see what folks had to say about them. Um, astrologically, this comes up for me a lot around the Cancer Capricorn axis. So those two signs, which are opposed to each other in a birth chart, if you take a look at the zodiac wheel, they're they're opposite one another. Um, but they both have they both often get described as like a conservative conservatizing, is that a word? Um, conservatizing, I think, uh, influence um, in different areas. So like Capricorn is kind of seen as conservative in the sense of like, it's about institutions. It's interesting because they're both cardinal signs. So they both have to do with like building something or creating something new. But with Capricorn, it's often described as like, it's building institutions that last a really long time. It's so it's associated with government, it's associated with law, it's associated with, maybe Libra is a little more law, but um, but government especially, like, things that are big and last a long time, mountains, right, <laughs> like, could be associated with Capricorn. Um, there's, there's that kind of, like, traditional in the sense of, like, long-lasting structures. And it's interesting that I think, like, that, to me, is associated with bad things a lot of the times because of the world I live in, because I think 
Capricorn, and then I think of like, well, what are the long-lasting structures I'm used to? Well, there's capitalism, there's colonialism, there's you know, there there's the U.S. government. Like none of these things feel very positive to me. Um, but there are also structures and institutions that are long-lasting that like aren't necessarily negative. Um, or it's like, what do I want to build now that's going to last hundreds of years, right, or thousands of years? Um, and then on the Cancer side, it's uh, you know, cardinal water, Cancer. So Capricorn's cardinal Earth. So Earth, material things, structure. You know, work, government. And then Cancer, it's water. So you, you're having more like this emotional, nourishing, nurturing influence. And the idea there is often family. So it's often associated with like traditional ideas around family, around like ma maternal energy. If you want to gender it, which of course I don't, but here we are. Um, you know, the idea of cancer being related to the mother, to pregnancy, to, you know, children. Um, you can take all the gender out of that and there can still be this kind of like idea of, um, hmm, privileging one's own family over others. And it's interesting as a ca cancer moon and rising, it's like, I clearly very much want to have like my people, right? I, I'm still, the idea of hurricane friends is in a funny way, is that that sort of like my people over everyone else which i want to be critical of because I, I i that can easily come into like a lot of privileged thinking and a lot of stuff i don't like um but but it is like i noticed that the way there even if it's not like the traditional family structure in that way doesn't necessarily mean they're that there's not like a way of doing that that has a lot of similarity. Like there can be a longing for whatever it is that you get from traditional traditional family and like ancestry and religion and all of that. Um, and just wanting to be like, how do we do this in a way that's more aligned with personal values? Um, what does that look like? And so I think that's the interesting question for the Cancer Capricorn axis is like, what can we build whether it's in the kind of family zone and care, cancer is associated with care, right? Like how can we care for each other in ways that are more radical? And then how can we build structures and institutions that are more radical? Um, and not seed cancer and Capricorn every time they come up to being like, oh, that's the more conservative because I'm not fucking conservative. You can, do I look, I'm not, but like, you know, um, yeah, I don't want to see that ground necessarily. And a transit that has been like, I think a long-term transit that is interesting here is Uranus and Taurus. Um, was it May 2018, I believe was when, don't quote me, look it up, but I believe when Uranus went into Taurus um, and it's there now and it's gonna be there a little longer. And uh, you know, there, a lot of the talk about Uranus, when Uranus went into Taurus was that it was this kind of like odd energy because Uranus is a planet that's associated with um, like lightning quickness, uh, innovation, like um, electricity, like uh, um, revolution, right? Like Uranus has this very like surprise kind of vibe. Um, and then Taurus is a sign that's fixed Earth is very like stable longevity sustainability um earth uh like literally like the earth like um that the natural world um you know material abundance and and stubbornness right like things kind of staying the same taurus is not an energy that like loves change and so you throw uranus in there and it's like Psh! um and you can think of it as blowing up um things that are more stable. But I actually, the way I think of Uranus and Taurus, and the reason why I think it relates, is that it is like an encouragement of what would, without, without ignoring that it's in Taurus, like if Uranus has to play by Taurian rules to some extent, or like has to engage with the landscape of Taurus, and has to engage with like, material wealth, has to engage with um, ideas of like abundance and quality and sustainability and um, other stuff like that. 
brain. Um, brain fog. Pardon my long COVID. Brain fog. Um, but like, what does Uranus do in that space, right? If you're you like, if Uranus isn't quite at home, you know, we have a lot of like not quite at home. You know, we also have Saturn and Pisces right now. Another example of like, what does this planet do when it's? What does Saturn do when it falls into the ocean? What does Uranus do when you you know stick it in Taurus? And I think one of the ways you could engage with that. Uranus and Taurus, and maybe is important to engage with at some point in this long, longer transit. Um, you know, with the kinds of stuff that I've been wrestling with has all been coming up during this transit, is to think about like what's the radical version of sustainable um, material. Um, of, of safety, right? Like what, what's a radical approach to safety? What's a radical approach to feeling secure? Um, and sometimes Uranus, I think, can come to Taurus and say like, we're gonna shake up things that you cl have cling, tend to cling to for too long. Like things, you know, the kind of shadow side of Taurus of like getting so obsessed with your safety or your security or the status quo that you have trouble changing like Uranus will come along and say mm, no um but maybe one of those things in a weird way for people like me is actually like the considering it's a binary between like radical and conservative or you know coming to shake up the idea that you don't get to have stuff in that zone um and still wanting to do that in a way that is like responsible to to radical values. I mean, depending on your age and your association with queerness, you may recall um, the very nuanced discussions and deep discussions that went on around um, queer movements and and the kind of co-optation of of queer movements by gay marriage um, movements. But part of that was an understandable, I think, impulse, even though I was fairly opposed to it, I get it. Um, there was this kind of like message that was basically like, wait a minute, straight people don't get to co-opt marriage, right? Like straight people don't get to say family, like having family and having marriage and having children, um, you know, is their domain. And that the queers are all these like messy promiscuous, non-family type people right like basically there there was I mean I think in some ways a sort of like at first that was actually a pretty radical impulse to say like no we're we're gonna live in your suburbs so fuck you right um uh to say like no you, you actually don't get to like just have that um of course the problem is that 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 then became so normalized in the queer movement that um over time it's like wait a minute what about the queer part <laughs> um and like what about the people who don't fit into that mold right so it's like there's always a swinging back and forth of you know you don't want to go too far in one direction um or if you do you want to you know start questioning and thinking critically about it but um yeah i think i just like question sometimes if like we've gone so far into what can become almost isolationist and you know focused on like identity and the ways in which we're outsiders all of which is important it's important to question the status quo it's important to question norms it's important to make space for who we are as we are but then like how do we then take the who we are as we are and like meld and find our people and in some cases compromise um, and create sustainable, like lasting institutions, lasting families, lasting traditions while still honoring our values. Um, it's a big question. I'm probably not the first person you've heard talking about this topic, but um, I just wanted to kind of like throw that little like astrological spin on it, bring in a uh, that tarot reading is an example of just like how when when these themes come up you can kind of like work with them work with your own reaction to them and your own um relationship to them and the emotions underlying 
which I think is part of, in 2024, the collective work we're all asked to do. It's a strength year, um, and strength is a card that really, you know, pulls us to, like, see what's coming up for us underneath um, and, and be present with, like, our reactions and our emotions um, to propositions that might occur. Um, so, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Let me know in the comments, um, like, how do you... If you, if you consider yourself kind of in this like radical zone, um, how do you relate to energies that are sometimes, or archetypes that are like considered conservative? Um, do you, do you worry about being like seen as too normative or too conservative? Do you feel like you miss out on things? Um, how have you tried to reclaim and reinvent? Um, and are there ways in which you've actually found that, like, you know, coming back to things that that you knew, things that were, like, already established, um, has been healthy for you, maybe, as well? Um, so, yeah, if any of those questions, like, spark some interest, you can leave a comment below. But as always, I encourage you to sign up to the newsletter if you haven't already, because that's the best place to know when there's going to be a new video. Um, because you'll also find out there when there's going to be a new blog post. You can also find out about free resources, um, offerings I have coming up, and there's exclusive um, essays that I write for the newsletter that you can't find anywhere else. So I would love to see you there. Um, and if you want to, you know, navigate uh, your experience with me and find out about what I do, um, you can do that through the newsletter as well or through my website. All of that is found down below in the links, and we'll see you in the very next video. All right.